I read an article earlier this week that on average, many believers spend two hours in church per week. Which translates to 104 hours per year. Which translates to four days in a year. And there are 365 days in a year. So it's essential that if we spend in totality only four days in the church in the year of 365, those hours must be spent wisely. And the rest, we must take ownership. It's instructive that your growth as a believer is on you because you have 361 to yourself. It's only four that is held in church four days. So since there are fewer days in the year that we spend in church, you cannot be in church and be sleeping because already we are in deficit. <laughs> I'm trying to wake some people up right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. In Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, We are starting a new series called Strength in Adversity. Since the women have told us that their conference is Strength in Adversity, we might as well follow them. I'm telling you, a good husband follows his wife. I'm just telling you. I'm, te I'm just telling you. You don't have to agree with me. I've been married for 34 years. And it has worked for me. And if you are not agreeing with me, that's why you're having problems. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's in your body. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Paul said, let love be without hypocrisy. He said, abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saint, given to hospitality. In the above letter, Paul is writing, even though there are disagreements, when the you know, Bible scholars, when they talk about the, the writings of Romans, that it wasn't really Paul that wrote it. But, but I don't think my teaching today is on that, to decide who wrote it. Whether it was Paul or somebody else, it doesn't matter, it's still the word of God. Praise the Lord. So I choose to believe it was Paul. And Paul was writing about the qualities of a good Christian believer. He was saying that when we are going to love as Christians, we should love without, with, without hypocrisy. We should abhor what is evil, hate what is evil. And he went on and on. But the one I want to focus on for the subject of our teaching is when he said, be patient in tribulation. Patient in tribulation. It is becoming more and more difficult these days for believers to stand in the face of adversity. One way or the other, I think we have been deceived 
in the church, believing that if you are a Christian, you will not face adversity. And, and, and I'm saying, who, who has bewitched us? Who told us that lie that we will not face adversity? Christianity does not excuse you and I from adversity. It happens to believers. It happens to non-believers. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself said in John 16, verse 33, John 16, 33, he said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. He said, But in the world you will have tribulation. He said, But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Overcome the world. These are the words of Jesus. Saying that even when you go through tribulation, you should be of good cheer. Why? Because you are already in him. And that in itself should bring you peace of mind. Hallelujah. So what is adversity? It's from an English word called advertise. Adversite, rather. Adversite. It means opposition. It means persecution. It means hostility. At times, it could be misfortune. At times, it could be hardship. At times, it could be persistent difficulty. Persistent difficulty. Trying to get something done, and it's like you are trying to pull teeth. Very difficult, very difficult, persistent difficulty, adversity. There is a way people go through adversity that even if they don't announce or tell you that they are going through, you look at them and you know something is not right. It's not right. Praise the Lord. I believe many years ago, I, 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 I went to a friend's funeral. I was in Nigeria, and, and I had a friend passed, and I went. As soon as I, I, I walked into the church, somebody called my name. Now, very few people called me by my last name. In fact, there's only one friend I have that calls me my last name. Just said, Odutola, I, I knew who it is. And I looked at him, I couldn't, I couldn't recognize him again. At all. I said, What happened to you? He said, Nothing. I said, I said No, no. I said, yeah, No, okay. I said, What happened to you? He said, I can't talk now. I said, yeah, No, okay. Because we were at the funeral of a colleague, our age mate. It wasn't a good place to discuss that because if, even the atmosphere was not even a good atmosphere. Even though I had not seen him for several years, but as soon as I saw him, I knew something was not right. I'm talking about strength in adversity. Praise the Lord. But in James chapter 1, James now gives us a perspective of how to behave or how to handle adversity when it comes. From verse 1, it says, James a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings, my brethren. Note in this writing that it was writing to Christians here. 
Hallelujah. Because there are times when we go through some challenges, we'll, we'll say it like, I reject it in Jesus' name. Like, can you please just stop that? He was writing to Christians here. To Christians. He said, count it all joy. When you do what? When you fall into what? Various I'm not a student of English because I've told you many times, unfortunately, they used vernacular to teach me English. So the way I think is that I think in Yoruba first before I translate to English. So as I'm talking to you, there is a lot of translation in my head, a lot of translation. At times, I speak English from a cultural perspective. So, if you think what I'm doing is easy, I'm telling you it's not easy. <laughs> now, talk of the spiritual angle of it. Praise the Lord. He says, when you fall, it's different from if you fall. So, when means it's a question of time. It's a question of time. Let nobody laugh concerning my situation because yours also is a question of... It, this is not the cause of... Just understand that life matters. Because if you say to yourself, I'm going to be so old before I go and meet Christ, eh, your eye will see... One or two, two things. So he says, when you fall, can't you, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. He said, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, nothing. The first thing you and I must realize concerning adversity is that it's a test of your faith. A test of your faith. That's why the Bible says that if you fail in the days of adversity, your faith is small, small, small. It's a test of our faith. Because in that verse 3 of James chapter 1, he's saying that knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Patience. I know that some people now, you see them, they appear to be patient. But let me tell you one thing. Faith or waiting on God will teach you patience. If you don't have patience, raising teenagers will teach you patience. If not, you will end up in jail. Especially raising teenagers in America, it will teach you patience. Because there are times you want to look for a gun, but because you don't have one, you will just go to your car and drive your car and just drive around the neighborhood and you can't tell anybody why you're driving around the neighborhood. <laughs> anybody understand what I'm talking about here? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank God. I have no more teenagers. Mm. Those of you that have teenagers, I'm praying for you. <laughs> the Lord who saved me, he will deliver you too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I will show you this tape of your amen to your teenagers. <laughs> Praise God. In Exodus chapter 15, Exodus chapter 15, from verses 22 to 25, the children of Israel had just been delivered because Pharaoh went after them. 
and suddenly the, the host of Pharaoh, they all perished in the Red Sea, right? And the Bible says that as soon as they came out of that, they went into the wilderness and for three days, there was no water. Have you ever had a challenge in life after a victory? You are just celebrating good news in your family, good news in your marriage, good news with your finances. Suddenly, from nowhere, bam! And it appears your marriage might not be able to stand. And you just celebrated 10th anniversary. Is there anybody that understands what I'm talking about here? They were just rejoicing. That see what the Lord has done. The us and his riders have been thrown into the sea. Only for them for three days. And there was no water. This is the other challenge. When they found water, it was bitter. Ah. Has God helped you with your health and you went to do a blood walk only to be told that we'll see a spot and you never knew there was any spot. I, I came here because of cholesterol. I'm going home with a spot on my liver. What is this? My wife just announced we are expecting a baby. Why am I getting the pink slip? We just bought a house. This is not the time to lose my job. I'm just trying to give examples that you can relate with. Is there anyone that understands what I'm talking about here? Good news. But on one side, here comes a challenge. Praise the Lord. Now, this is what will amaze you in this story. Because the Bible says that God did that just to test them. Can we look at this? Look, please give me verse 25. Exodus 15, 25. Look at this. So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet because before they were bitter. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them. And there he what? He did what? He did what? He did what? Somebody talk. Why are you murmuring when you are going through a test? It's a test of your faith. Yeah, he tested them. Nobody promotes you until you pass a test. And we are praying for promotion. And we are saying we expect a promotion. There, God did what? He tested them. I have faced many tests. And I keep on saying to myself, this is a test, I must pass it. This is a test, I must pass it. This is a test, I must pass it. Do you know many times you face tests in your marriage? You know, you are so angry and so mad, you know what to say, but because you know it's a test, you just keep quiet. But some people, their mouth is so sharp, they will never keep quiet. They must reply. That's why everybody will abandon you because you keep on talking. It's a test. It's a test. 
It's not every answer you know that you must give. There are times you will keep quiet. This is a test. It's a test. It's a test. Your body will be doing one thing like that. You say it's a test. It's a test. It's a test. No, it's a test. My wife is an expert in that thing. She says to me, if I answer you now, we will spoil this good thing here. I will not. I say, that's why I married you. You are a wise woman. <laughs> Any single year, make sure you marry a wise person. You know? Wisdom is the principle. A wise woman builds a house. If you are always answering back and saying things, Go and check your wisdom. It's not enough. It's not enough. Wisdom makes you keep quiet at times, even though you know the answer. You know you can give him below the belt, but you keep quiet. That's wisdom. That's how your house will not break. Thank you. I know I'm preaching better than the way you are reacting before. Hallelujah. How do we respond? In the time of test. Time of test. Luke 22. Luke 22. It's a story we know very well. From verse 31. Luke 22. Verse 31. <laughs> the Lord said, Jesus speaking here, Simon, Simon, Indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. He said, but I have prayed for you that your faith, can you see that again? Should not fail. He said, when you have returned to me, do what? Strengthen. Ah. In this story, Satan knew he could not do anything with Simon without an approval from the Lord. So, Jesus said, Simon, there's a test coming. Satan has asked to do what? To sift you. You cannot say you are loyal unless you have been tested with disloyalty. No, don't claim your loyalty. You see, don't claim you don't steal until they put serious money in your hands. Unless whether you will not touch it. The reason why you're not stealing is that they are putting 1,000, 2,000. Can you handle half a million and not steal? You that you cannot handle tax refund <laughs> and you are using a security of uh, your cousin and your uncle and you are saying they are your children and your dependent. When I look at the sifting, and I think I've described that thing before. The only thing that it reminds me of is what we used to do growing up. <laughs> you know, I was saying to my sister here, I said, we grew up on the same street, but we used to look at our family as privileged. You know, and she said, we privileged. I said, you are privileged, you. <laughs> you have television, we didn't have television. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's part of the thing growing up. Ah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my, my mom didn't go to school. Your mom was a nurse. Privileged. Privileged. You are living three stories. You are living in a bungalow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reliving over 60 years of something. So, privileged. So, on our own side, let me explain about sifting. So, 
you are sent to the market to go and buy beans. There's red beans, right? It's one of the most expensive. There are twins beans. Yeah, yeah. If you are born in America, you might not understand what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> so, because you are, you are looking at me like, okay, what's he talking about? What's he talking about? You know, I told you, I told you. The way I think, I'm telling you, you know. But if you are sitting next to somebody who, who, who can break it down, please help me, you know. Help me to preach this morning. But there are also white beans. White beans are the cheapest beans in the market, supposedly. But they are really not the cheapest. There's another set of beans that are the cheapest. They are the ones still in their shell. Those are the cheapest. So those are the ones that we buy. So when we get home, we put it on the tree in the sun for the sun to dry it up. Because if it's not dry, you can't get the beans out of it. Are we still on the same page? Yes. When we finish with that, we start taking chunk full in our hands and we rub it together. And then we drop it. We'll pick it again, we'll rub it. Anybody that grew up around the time I grew up, understand what I'm talking about? Thank you for encouraging me. <laughs> there are not many of us in this store. We are endangered species, but it's okay. We do like this, we put it down. Then after a while, we put, we lift it up to flip it. We blow it. What happened to the shaft? The shaft goes this way. What happened to the beans? The beans come here. This is what happens when Satan said he wanted to sift Peter. Is that whenever you are being sifted or going through a challenge, what is not pure in you is like the shaft that goes this way. And the real you that God wants to use is the real beans that comes this way. Is there anybody that understands what I'm talking about here? Why? Because we cannot grind those beans to make money, money with the shaft. We have to get the shaft out of the way. God cannot use you until he tries you and he messes you up until you submit to him. That's when he will use you. Is anybody hearing what I'm talking about here? So, listen to me now. If your prayer is God use me, Are you ready for sifting? Because it can't use you in this state without sifting. Because it must sift every impurity. Oh. I'm not saying God is looking for a perfect person. But in the process of your imperfection coming to him, you will begin a sifting. And that sifting, please come. Just watch me. That sifting is like a car in an accident. For it to be brought back, to the original state, there is what we call panebitin. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? To an average watcher, why are you maltreating this car? Don't you know how much I'm paying in car note? But we cannot bring this car back to the original state. And even better, if we don't do that. And that's what travel in life takes you through. God is finally beating you. And you are saying, God, leave me alone. Leave me alone. This is too much. And he's saying, no, I want the best out of you. And until I finally beat you, I will not get the best out of you. That's why I'm saying, stop looking at travels of life as if the devil is after you alone. Look at it as if there is something that is going to come out of it. 
And that thing will make you a better person. Please sit down. No wonder David said, I was glad. I was afflicted. I was glad. I was afflicted. The testing of your faith produces patience. Yeah. There is a way you have been praying and you are waiting on God for something. And it's delay in coming. You will, be, you will develop patience after a while. And that patience leads to trust. Because it looks as if he has delayed in coming. But you know he will still show up. That's why Job said, even though he slay me, yet, yet I will trust him. I don't know where you are today. I don't know. But I've gone so far with God that I cannot but trust him. Where else will I go? Where else? Where else will I go? Where? That's what Job meant. Job did not call the problem to himself. It was God that introduced him to it. He said, Satan, where are you coming from? He said, I've been looking to and fro to look for who I can just mess up. He said, but have you considered my servant Job? Ah. Oh. He said, I will have touched him. Is it not because you put a edge around him? God said, I take it off. Go and touch him. Job could not explain it. But he still trusted God. In your pain, do you still trust God? Say, no! He slay me. Say, yet, I will trust in him. Faith as a process. It's called trials and tribulation at times. Faith is not only in receiving. I believe God for car, I receive it, that's faith. It's not only in that. Faith also is exercised in the place of travail. God at times will use our marriages to test our faith. Test our faith. He can give you a cantankerous husband just to test your faith. There was a woman who married a foolish man. The man's name is called Nabal. And that woman did not divorce him. She stayed in there. Because the woman knew that this man, his name is foolishness. But it's okay. We have entered this bus already. If I get down from this one, the other one I'm going to enter. Which way? There are times God can bring you across some pastors that will test your faith. 
and he has used you congregation to test my own faith too. <laughs> oh yes, yes. You think you are quick tempered. You think you can reply everybody. Come, I exchange my position. Let me give it to you for one week. If you know, you will not be taking medication. Why? Because you might see a church member as a problem, which is okay, but God is using him or her to teach you patience. Teach you patience. Is anybody hearing me today? <laughs> Let me read the scripture and we'll round this up for us. First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. Verses 8 to 11. Ah. Peter speaking. He said, be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion. Seeking who may devour. He said, resist him steadfastly in the faith. Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. He said, but may the God of all grace who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you have what? I want us to read it together. After you have what? So, after your suffering, what will God do? He will what? Perfect you. He will do what? Establish you. He will do what? He will strengthen you. And he will do what? How do you attain Perfection without suffering. There's an African proverb or saying, really, that you have never suffered in life and you say you are wise. Who is your teacher? Who is your teacher? When you see people doing like this in life, as if they are self made men, just be looking at them. Oh. It's because they have not seen trouble. I'm telling you, a report of prostate cancer will humble you. All that hand will come down all of a sudden. Because now you have to number your days. Yeah. Let's rise on our feet. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah.